From the High Definition Educational Broadcast Center at Bergen Community College's main campus in Paramus, this is Studio Bergen. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Levanka, and welcome to Studio Bergen. We're back in our traditional format this month with the spring 2012 semester now fully underway. In this half hour, we'll look at the news, events, and people making headlines at the state's largest community college. We begin today with highlights from February's biggest event, Black History Month. The 29-day celebration included visits from a wide range of individuals representing African American culture. Keynote speaker and 1994 Pulitzer Prize winner Isabel Wilkerson opened the month on February 1st discussing her latest book, The Warmth of Other Suns, which addresses the great migration in the U.S. There were six million Americans who were part of this great migration. And what they did was they actually fled a caste system that is almost beyond imagination. They, in many respects, this was not a move or a relocation as someone might experience if they decided that they were going to move from Chicago to New York or from, uh, from Dallas to San Diego. It was not a simple matter of moving. This was, in fact, a defection, a defection and a seeking of political asylum from uh, within the borders of one's own country. This is the only time in American history that American citizens felt they had to or had no choice but to flee one part of their own country, their own home region, for another part of their own country just to be recognized as the citizens to which they had been born. Remiss to celebrate Black History Month without a nod to the vast contributions of African Americans in music, Bergen's Aretha McMillan spoke at February 13th's A Tribute to Black Music. She focused on the legacies of the late Sylvia Robinson, Heavy D, and James Brown, who passed away last year. The event concluded with a performance by a group comprised of Bergen students called Spontaneous. <laughs> Black History Month also included a panel discussion on civil rights, a lecture from Princeton professor Tara Hunter, a black business summit hosted by Hot 97 DJ Uncle Ralph, and a capstone event honoring the college's black student scholars. The college enrolls more than 160 students from African countries, including Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. Black students make up nearly 8% of the college's total population. February also marked the opening of the college's search for a permanent president. The Board of Trustees approved the hiring of an executive recruitment firm, Isaacson Miller Inc., at its meeting on the 8th to assist in the complex process of locating candidates for the position, which is regarded as the most prominent community college job in the state due to Bergen's size and stature. A recently formed county-wide committee that includes members of the community, college employees, Bergen County leaders, board members, and others will review resumes and vet candidates for the position. A permanent president is expected to be selected this year. Current interim president, Dr. Jose Adamas, will apply for the position. In other board news, by unanimous vote February 7th, the Bergen Community College Board of Trustees confirmed the appointments of attorney James D. Dimitrakis and former TD Bank Executive Vice President James R. Napolitano to the college's governing panel. Mr. Dimitrakis has spent his 45-year professional life as an attorney, business, and real estate developer in Bergen County. Mr. Napolitano begins his second term on the college's board, previously serving six years from 1998 to 2003. After retiring from a 33-year career in banking last year, Mr. Napolitano currently works as a real estate consultant. Meanwhile, Bergen faculty are also making news this month as two received recognition for their work in and outside of the classroom with 2011 National Institute for Staff and Organizational Development Excellence Awards. The winners, history professor Dr. Phil Dilce 
and theater professor Jim Bumgartner will attend a ceremony in Austin, Texas in May to receive the awards. We spoke with the pair in this month's Faculty Focus. You become a nice art award winner um, by having the awards come in from the side and not aiming at them. Uh, there's two types of ambition. You always want to work with ambitious people. There's the ambition to be and the ambition to do. The people who are ambitious to be are very dangerous because it's all self-aggrandizement. The ambition to do talks about you want to make a contribution, you want to do something special. And those kinds of people wind up doing very well. And here's a good example of it. Um, you know, uh, if you look at this, you, you see that at this, this college there are a lot of people who want to be ambitious to do. And the awards come in, the promotions come in from the side. Uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate to be sitting here with my colleague um, because he deserves this. He's ambitious to do. Both. And, and it's, it's, it's great because uh, both Phil and I were nominated by other faculty uh, here um, for, for what we do. And, and so it's an honor to be chosen and selected. And then it goes to a, a committee. And then they decide um, um, if, in fact, uh, which of the nominations uh, will get awarded. And uh, I think it was the first time in a long time, if ever, that two of us were nominated. And, and we both uh, uh, are, are winners. So it's great. And, and well deserved. I mean, uh, you know, we're in different fields entirely. Um, what I know about theater, you could put in a thimble. Um, but and what I know you, about suburbia. No, 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 that's not true. Um, but what you find with my colleague here is he shares knowledge readily. Um, that's not just a teaching technique, that's a collegial technique. Uh, he knows that you, you know, the limits of your knowledge and he informs you so you can work with the theater under his direction, but he's informed you. It's, it's, that's what's special. You know, if you're ambitious to do, you're a collegial person. You, you've got to work with other people. It's not individual anymore. What Phil does is he he's, has this wonderful way of, of getting great faculty, staff, administrators, people outside the campus to work with him as, as a great collaboration for everything you do. So part of the excellence that you do is, is the outreach to everyone to make them come together. And, and they want to come together and talk about this. And, they all, and, and then you send everybody off um, to do their own individual work. And, the, and when they come back, they've got some great prizes for you, which um, well, I think that's part of the whole, that we, we love doing what we do, and, and, and that's a part of it. While the NYSOD Awards recognized their work, they were quick to point out it's a team effort. I think it's a recognition of there's individual achievement, but I, I think contributions to the college as a whole. Um, I think that's even more important. You know, what have you done to make this place a better place? Mm -hmm. I, and, and that's what we should be doing. Not only, you have three missions here. One is um, uh, teaching. You, you know, you, you really have to excel in a classroom, but two, is professional development. I mean, what are you teaching? You have to develop yourself professionally. You can't keep teaching the same thing for the next 30 years. Uh -huh. And the third is civic engagement. And, you know, that's what it is. It's a collective effort. If, if you understand what the goals of the college are, there's where you aim. You don't aim at promotions. You don't aim at rewards because it's silly to do that. Uh -huh. If it comes, it'll come from the side, from your efforts aiming at the main objectives. Mm -hmm. And working here at Bergen's just oh, yeah. opens up all these great opportunities. So, so like both of us have that opportunity to, 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 as Phil had said, reach out in those different three categories. So we, I love the classroom. I, I, I couldn't imagine not being in the classroom now. Um, but also I love getting the community involved, coming to see our shows, and then uh, also uh, going to theater and understanding what's going on in theater in New York and around this country. So I think it's keeping our fingers on all those different pieces. For both professors, the award changes little. There's still plenty of work to do. You're gratified, but as soon as the award is made, you're on to other things. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I there feel is no there... by the idea. I feel, you know, yeah. I, I feel grateful that it's happened, but I'm 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 so heck excited about uh, oh, having not, it, it and moving on. Right. It's it's not cavalier. You can't be cavalier right, about it. It's right. oh, you're really on it. It's a great honor. And we appreciate what our colleagues have named us to mm -hmm. this. But after it's over, it's on to the next project. Yeah, and we, we, got to, we get to go to Austin, Texas, that's so right. that's the exciting part, and I've never that's been right. to Austin. Neither so have I. To get You're the right. award, but uh, uh, other than that, I think it's, it's yeah. business as usual after this is uh, said and done. 
The talented Bergen faculty was on display at the Tri-State Best Practices Conference, Innovation and Creativity in the Community College Classroom event, February 18th at Bergen Community College at the Meadowlands. The day-long conference was attended by community college administrators and professors from across the state and Tri-State area. Breakout sessions hosted by Bergen professors included topics such as bridging cultural divides in the classroom and innovative techniques for math. A few weeks earlier at Bergen Community College at the Meadowlands, a different type of conference rolled out the red, white, and blue carpet. This one was for our nation's military veterans. At the Veterans Re-Entering the Workforce Education and Career Conference on February 8th, Military heroes were presented with a variety of services and resources that aimed to help their transition back to civilian life. More than 100 veterans attended the conference, according to event organizer Jackie Lou Rea, who said the event is important. It's critically important because you know, as, as a military person, they are extremely regimented and they're very well trained um, and very, very disciplined, but extremely focused. Uh, when you come back to civilian life, and, and not being a military person myself, but hearing what our attendees and our veterans' connections tell us, is that they are so focused on the military that it, the adjustment to get back into civilian life can be, can be challenging. One of the big things that we try to do, and we do this with our partners at North Jersey Media, is uh, try to explain to them that the, the years that they spent in the military and learned different kinds of skills and abilities, they can now transfer into civilian positions here as they come home. And really that's the most critical thing is that, you know, they, it wasn't a wasted time in the military and certainly the training that they received in the, in the military can now be transferred into very um, well-paying families supportive positions here at home. The college enrolls hundreds of military veterans, a number expected to rise as men and women serving in Iraq and Afghanistan return home and take advantage of the post 9-11 GI Bill. Of course, after war, we all hope, comes peace. For the Peace Corps, though, either way, the organization remains committed to that goal. One man's experience in the organization is profiled through photographs at the college's Philip Siarco Jr. Learning Center in Hackensack last month. Owen Fitzgerald, a former Peace Corps volunteer, recently returned from a two-year assignment to Mali, West Africa. The exhibit was featured in the Siarco Center's lobby. Coming up after a short break, we'll look at other news at Bergen this month, and we'll have longtime faculty member Ursula Parrish Daniels in studio. We'll be right back. You were the last to be born in a family of seven brothers. That's why you had to sleep on the seventh bunk bed and you developed vertigo. And that's why you couldn't become a pilot and you had to study engineering. You patented 367 inventions, but only three made it to market. The clap clap candle, the lazy runners, and the frit and go. That's why you don't have an apartment on the 16th floor, and you have it on the 5th. But that's where you met Carmen. After 237 dates, you finally proposed. With her, you had three children. The fourth ended up being a dog. It's not the same, but he adores you. Numbers change your life. That's why you should take control of your credit score by keeping your credit card balances low. For more tips, visit numberschangeyourlife.org. We're, We're Giants, Giants fans. fans. I'm a Giants fan. We're Giant fans. And We're Giants, Giants fans. fans. I'm a good sport. We're good, We're good sport. sport. We're good sports. I always have a designated, designated driver. We always have a designated driver. We, we always have a designated driver. Giants fans. Giants fans. Don't, don't let fans, fans drive drunk. Responsibility. Responsibility has its rewards. Responsibility has its rewards. Go, Go Giants! Giants. Go Giants! Go Giants! Go Giants! Go Giants! Welcome back to Studio Bergen. I'm Larry Levanka. A few youngsters may have walked on campus with toothaches and frowns, but they left with smiles thanks to the college's dental hygiene program and the annual Give Kids a Smile Day event February 3rd. Elementary school students and their parents visited the college for free checkups sponsored by the college and the dental hygiene program. Students in the program perform the checkups. Program coordinator Debbie Cook 
said the event fills a need. Um, it's certainly a, a fun day for us because we get to see children. Um, we do take care of children as well as adults and um, geriatric population all year round. But um, on Give Kids a Smile Day, it's children only. We get to decorate. As you notice, we have lots of balloons and we try to make it child friendly. So that's a fun part of the um, setup process for the students and myself. And then it's also nice because we know we're doing something that's so well, uh, so needed in New Jersey. You know, providing them with their examination their prophylaxis, which is the cleaning, and this year we're also helping um, with doing some restorations. Bergen County freeholder Joan Voss also stopped by to give kids a smile. On February 17th, Bergen recognized the achievements of its 419 GED graduates at its 10th annual recognition ceremony in the Anna Maria Sacconi Theater. This year's valedictorian, Robin R. Crespo, is the founder and CEO of ING Activewear, an organization that creates apparel with the mission of bridging the world between mainstream fashion and philanthropy. Bergen's GED program is based out of its Searco Learning Center in Hackensack. Meanwhile, sure, the suburbs may look like a portrait of happiness, and according to Bergen professors sitting on the panel at the Dark Side of Suburbia conference, that's exactly what movies, television, and pop culture would have you believe. But as discussed at the event, the glossy veneer is just that, a veneer. Professor Maureen Ellis Davis discussed the origins of the stereotypes of suburbia. Large factories, the introduction of the interstate system, the rise to dominance of communications as the new industry that would replace the old industry, like automobile factories change the very nature of the society. People got on the road and the city started to be seen as a place where life was ending and developers saw an opportunity to grab this land and make money, meeting a need. I mean capitalism, right? And they did. And they had to get the biggest bang for the buck, you know, capitalism. So what did they do? Subdivisions. At the event, students and faculty gathered in attendance by participating and watching videos and asking questions during a Q&A. Bergen faculty hosted a teach-in on anti-Semitism on February 14th. A panel of six professors reflected on how anti-Semitism affects all people including those of Jewish and non-Jewish descent. Students filled the room in the new student center to listen and learn from the expert panel. In other news, March 26 will mark the beginning of registration for summer sessions, the college's summer class schedule. The classes are an excellent way for students from Bergen and other colleges to catch up on their work or move closer to graduation. To register, visit go.bergen.edu or the Registration Center, room A129 in the Pitkin Education Center at the college's main campus in Paramus. For other important dates this month, let's turn our attention to the campus calendar. Bergen Stages The Heiress will continue its run March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Ender Hall, while the Anna Maria Sacconi Theater will continue its season with events on March 7th, 9th, 10th, and 17th. For information on all shows, visit tickets.bergen.edu. The School of Continuing Education will host an information session on its fashion design program on March 3rd at 10 a.m. in the Moses Family Meeting and Training Center at the main campus in Paramus. The school will also host a session on the New Pathways to Teaching in New Jersey program on March 7th at 6 p.m., also in the Moses Center. For more information on either information session, please call 201-447-7466. Our guest in studio today is the Interim Executive Assistant to the President, Dr. Ursula Parrish Daniels. Coming off the heels of Black History Month and entering into Women's History Month at the college, there's perhaps no better person at this institution who identifies with both groups so appropriately and prominently. So, we're glad to have her on the show. Ursula, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, you just had a big honor this week. Uh, you were the keynote speaker at an event sponsored 
uh, by Burton County, uh, and you delivered the keynote address. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, the event was last evening, and it was in the freeholders' quarters on the fifth floor at one Bergen Plaza in Hackensack, and it was quite a stellar event, and I, of course, was quite honored to have been asked to be the keynote speaker at that event. Uh, seven women were honored for various, uh, in various categories, and prior to their being honored, I made a presentation which really focused on my paternal grandmother. And why do you think they tap, and I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but why do you think they tapped you on the shoulder to be the keynote address for an important event like that? I am not really sure. Uh, hopefully it is because they view my existence at this point in my life as, as you indicated, as one who is closely aligned with both uh, Black History Month and uh, women. In addition, this year's theme for Black History Month all over this nation is the celebration of legendary women. So that is probably why that occurred. Not that I am legendary, but that this is the year of the woman in terms of the theme of Black History Month. That's interesting. Um, as a black woman, okay, um, talk about a little bit what it means to not only have the opportunity to speak, but some of the things that black women have done. I mean, look at somebody like Michelle Obama, um, really a strong, powerful woman uh, who provides a great example for young black women. Talk a little bit about that. Well, what you're actually talking about is legacy. Mm -hmm. And in the olden days, long before you were around, legacy was viewed somewhat differently it was, we are going to look back and we're going to honor those people who have made tremendous contributions like Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and um, Ida B. Wells and Fannie Lou Hamer. But now there is a focus on living legacy. Mm -hmm. Some of the writings of Dr. Gloria Burgess have helped us to focus on the living legacy concept. And basically her theory is that Make sure you're doing what you wish to do as you move through space because, as you pointed out, you are a role model and people are looking at exactly what you do. I guess talk about that in terms of your career here at the college. I mean, you are one of the longest tenured uh, faculty members here uh, and currently, as we discussed uh, earlier, as the interim executive assistant to the president, um, one of the most prominent here, too. Um, talk about those years and talk about Bergen Community College. Well, obviously, uh, Larry, I came here when I was 12, and I have been <laughs> Facetious, here. Facetious, of course. Folks. Right. I've been here uh, a number of years. I have had the good fortune in my career of working and serving for all five presidents of this institution. Of course, not in the capacity that I serve currently. But as a professor of child development and psychology and as a former department chair, I have seen the college grow tremendously since I arrived here in 1976. I am honored that Dr. Jose Adamas selected me to work as his interim assistant, executive assistant. And I'm not real clear that I was prepared for all the work that it would entail because I, an administrative position, as you might well imagine, is totally different than being a teaching faculty mm -hmm. member. Mm -hmm. But I am learning. Uh, I learn something new every day. Um, the executive team is a wonderful team to work with. So we're all learning and we're all striving to make this college the living example of teaching and learning that we know that it should be. And obviously you bring great perspective and I mean that's why you're in that position that you're in right now. Um, talk about the changes over all these years here at Bergen. What sticks out in your mind, um, not just a, at a physical campus point of view, but um, even when discussing our, our student population, which has obviously grown, um, and culture here too? Our, our population has changed 
we have a more diverse population, mm -hmm. as many institutions do. When we began, I would say that we probably focused on transfer programs. And many of the students who came, came right out of high school and were really coming to the college to improve their GPAs and then transfer. The college's mission now is much more expansive. Our diversity not only includes diverse, diversity as it relates to race, religion, mm -hmm. et cetera, but we have um, an elderly population. Mm -hmm. We have our youngest population of children, of course, in the Child Development Center. Something you were intimately involved with yes, for many as, years. Right, as the founding director. But we have uh, all age groups. We are truly a community of learners. And I think that what I have seen is that there is an attempt on the part of people today, right now, to make sure that all of us benefit from the amazing resources that exist on this campus. And that includes the community, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, is it a source of pride for you to see, and I, I would imagine it is, where this college has, um, what it has become in 2012? It is definitively a source of pride for me. I am in the community often. As you know, I serve on numerous mm -hmm. boards in the community. And my mantra is come and see what we are about because we do have to constantly advertise so that people who look at the community college as a stepping stone might look at it differently as an end place and as a place for gathering the skills that they need to move forward with careers. Speaking of uh, an end place, yes. uh, all good things <laughs> must come to an end at some point, uh, and that would include your career. Are we getting any closer to that day, or uh, not that we want to push you out the door, obviously? That's an interesting question. Baby boomers are really disturbed about the fact, many of them who have retired, are disturbed about the fact that they did retire not only because of the economic situation that the country is in, but because they feel that they have so much more to give. And it's interesting because when you look at those people who are applying for jobs, many of them are retirees. But in answer to your question to me, I have not felt that it's time yet. You still have energy, plenty of it, I can, <laughs> I can attest. So. Right, I have not, um, it, it, it's not time for me yet, and people tell me all the time, you will know when it is time. But I have not felt that it was time yet. I have too many things to complete, too many grants to write, too many students to work with, and um, hopefully um, getting the college to the next step with the selection of the president is also very, very high on my agenda. And I am hoping, of course, that Dr. Jose Adamas is a successful candidate. And um, We discussed legacy. That's yes. That's one of the first things we talked about mm -hmm. today. What's the legacy that Dr. Daniels wants to leave Bergen Community College? The legacy that I would like to leave is uh, one of a person who gave her all professionally, who did not uh, step back when challenged, but who moved forward to make sure that this college has its rightful place. Her career's not over, but unfortunately the show <laughs> is, folks. So that's all the time we have for today on Studio Bergen. Don't forget to visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bergen Community College and tell us what you think. Thanks again to Dr. Daniels for being here and take care.